So I'll hand you over to Emily Deans, who's going to take you through the gut brain axis and the microbiome. Hi. So I am a psychiatrist and I practice in Massachusetts, and I'm really just pretty much a regular uh, general practice adult psychiatrist. I work a lot with a lot of people with therapy and medications. Um, but a while back, I became more interested because a lot of times the therapy and medications just doesn't quite get you there. So I became more interested in kind of lifestyle interventions for depression. Um, so I started writing a blog, which is sort of a very millennial way to end up um, speaking at conferences, and I speak at the American Psychiatric Association. Um, but really, I'm just a clinician. So as Anastasia covered in her talk, I'm really a science explainer um, rather than a scientist myself. Um, but you know, whatever it takes. Um, I like to focus on sort of the biological whole body aspects of mental health. Um, and I really like low risk, um, high value interventions and I base them on evolutionary principles and that's kind of how I look at things. So my talk here is um, on parasites, microbiome and behavior. It may not be the best talk here at AHS New Zealand, but I'm really hoping it's the weirdest. Um, <laughs> So parasites and uh, the microbiota, they did co-evolve with us for millions and millions of years, and we're really on the bleeding edge of health research right now, understating this, and we're finally with modern techniques, PCR, fish, all of these things, um, we can get an understanding of what we do know. So these are my disclosures, blog, blog, blog. I'm a blogger at Psychology Today, at Evolutionary Psychiatry, I'm a blogger for Medscape, or I will be, that's just begun. Um, if you don't want me to be paid for my work, you can go to evolutionarypsychiatry.blogspot.com if you don't want me to have any um, uh, disclosures to go. Um, I will be discussing off-label use of certain supplements and creatures. So um, why do we connect the microbiome and behavior? And we have to start here at this slide, which is we uh, connect the immune system and behavior. Um, the microbiome is actually the front lines of the immune system in our body. And a microbiome that's out of whack can be less effective against insults that are coming in, like food toxins, etc. And also via other mechanisms, so if the microbiome is off, you can get more translocation of things across the gut that we will call leaky gut, uh, sort of for want of a better term. And then the microbiome also has direct neural and hormonal mechanisms, um, which affects how we react to stress. So these are some of those signaling that uh, Karen uh, mentioned in her talk a few days ago. So psychopathology in general, might, this might be a surprise to you, but psychopathology is actually modulated by inflammation. The immune system interacts with the brain and environmental stressors to result in a state of uh, neurotoxicity. So if you have too much stress going on for too long, along with some environment, other environmental influences and maybe genetic loading, um, you will get an inflamed state in your brain, which will come out as symptoms of major depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, OCD, all of these um, sort of different mental health conditions. In this whole state, you get neurotoxicity, excitotoxicity, chronic stress, glucocorticoid resistance, sympathetic overdrive. So your sympathetic nervous system, which is your fight or flight nervous system, it gets like in the incredible hulk. And then your um, parasympathetic, which you might remember from high school biology, which is the sort of rest and digest system, it gets really, really weak. Um, so all of our interventions in mental health, whether it's medications, diet, lifestyle, all of these things, it's basically to strengthen that parasympathetic system and help you get back into sort of a better alignment with neuroregeneration and repair. So very recently, I'd say probably almost in the last three years, the microbiome um, research has really exploded, for want of a better word. So this just came in the mail right before I was about to do sort of a similar talk. And it's, you know, you are your microbiome and it has this person covered with bacteria and it's pretty awesome. Um, so it's, but what's funny because the microbiome is so popular um, that, you know, the first sentence of some of these research papers will be apologetic. It'll say, you know, despite the hyperbole often linked with the popular research field, the scientific rationale for probiotics is sound. So bear with me here. Um, my view of sort of how these probiotics uh, work and sort of this immune hypothesis and is based on uh, the work of Graham Rook. And it's not really the hygiene hypothesis. So the hygiene hypothesis is 
kind of this idea that your mom's obsessive cleanliness made you vulnerable to autoimmune disease. Is everyone sort of familiar with that hypothesis? I kind of toss that out because it's not really right. Because actually some microbes, actually um, exposures make your immune system even worse and you're more likely to get autoimmune disease and even psychiatric disorders. If you really think about it, a lot of these pathogens, such as the flu, measles, um, and many others that you think of, they're actually as new as agriculture. A lot of them came from domesticated animals. Um, so we're not really talking about the flu here. We're not talking about measles. We are talking about things that we co-evolved with for millions and millions of years, and those are our old friends. And those are our commensal bacteria. Um, I think everyone's fairly familiar with these. They live in your gut. The probiotics um, kind of help them out. But there are also two other groups that people don't often talk about, the pseudocommensal organisms. And these are the primarily um, saprophytic mycobacteria that were in the dirt and in, in water, and you would swallow them and they would pass through. So they don't stay, but they're, they're stopping by all the time, okay? And then the third group, which kind of gives everybody the heebie-jeebies, are the helminths and the eukaryotic parasites. But from an immune system perspective, these may be the most important. So the key point, the old friends are anti-inflammatory and the pathogens are inflammatory. And just to kind of give you a mental health example, people who have had a history of having influenza A, and if they have bipolar disorder, they're more likely to commit suicide and they're more likely to have a psychotic episode. So these things do have effects. The pathogens do have, have effects on how we react to things. So here's just you know, a fairly typical graph that you'll see in a lot of these different papers showing the increase in um, autoimmune disorders, particularly since 1950. And our immune system is really uh, complex, but we did co-evolve with these um, organisms. And to some extent, our immune system depends upon them to work correctly. So changes in our microbiota and living without parasites can have wide-reaching effects from increased risk of cancers like melanoma, eczema, allergies, ulcerative colitis, celiac disease, Crohn's disease, MS, and you're gonna laugh because I'm mentioning pretty much every single possible disease state here. Gut, skin, vascular, fat storage problems, type one diabetes, hay fever, inflammatory bowel disease, multiple sclerosis. Many of these increased two to three fold um, since the 1950s and even since 1975. So our study of the microbiome actually began here in um, 1683, this is Anton von Leeuwenhoek, um, and he looked through his microscope and saw tooth scrapings, um, and there were little living animalcules, very prettily moving. <laughs> I think that's a translation, but I like it. Um, but we, we sort of stopped here for a long time because many of our commensal bacteria can't be cultured. They do not live outside um, your gut. So we really had to wait for a modern genome, genome sequencing techniques and also the, um, kind of had to get the smarts to study germ-free mice, so germs that have been born and raised without any microbiota whatsoever. So the first, this first group of our old friends are our commensals. And you, I'll see numbers going from 34 to 100 trillion microorganisms. I don't know if that makes a big difference, 34, 100 trillion. Um, it's 10 times the number of cells in your body. So this means that 90% of your cells are these guys. You are only 10% of your cells. It's also 150 times the gene of your genome. Um, and there are nine different phyla, and the most studied are the lactobacillus and the bifidobacterium. And we also know a bit about what we call the pathogens, like E. coli, H. pylori, Clostridia, you probably hear, hear some of these. It does get complicated because sometimes H. pylori is a good guy, sometimes it's a bad guy. So, you know, you, it, until you know, these are all sort of exist in a certain setting and it's, it has to do with genetics, it has to do with what you eat. And so it, also the different clades of microbiota kind of work together. So we're really just coming to understand um, sort of what's even going on. And what these guys do is they coexist with our gut pathogens, our commensals do. And they um, fortify the intestinal barrier. Um, they help uh, our secretory IgA, which are these little immune molecules that go out into your gut, kind of help them along. And they also fortify nutrient absorption, and they metabolize and give us some compounds that we might not. So if you eat vitamin K1, 
Um, some, if you have the right gut microbiota, it'll make vitamin K2 for you, and you can absorb it. You know, we um, had a talk uh, mentioning how you can get vitamin K2 mostly from animal sources. You can also get it from your gut bacteria, and it makes short-chain fatty acids and also can sometimes help you metabolize fructose. So germ-free mice are more susceptible to infections and had, have deficits in the maturation of their immune system. But who cares, right? I'm a psychiatrist, so I work with people up here, and these guys are, well, they're all over your body, but the guys I'm mostly talking about are right here. This is why. So um, it turns out that gut microbes communicate with the brains in three different ways. So there are immune mechanisms, hormonal mechanisms, and then probably the creepiest one, direct communication. Okay, so here is the gut-brain axis, and it's a little bit complicated, um, but as you can see, the gut pathogens will send signals to the immune system, which will um, send an inflammatory signal, so that's IL-1 and IL-6, to the brain and make it kind of upregulate your stress response, all right? So you have gut pathogens, you get stressed. That makes sense. It will also, um, via prostaglandin E2, um, directly... Um, tell the adrenal cortex to also release cortisol as well. So those are these are two of the three ways that the gut bacteria, particularly the pathogens, interact with your brain. Does that make sense? Say so upregulate your stress response. And how we know this is that um, study of germ-free mice and their microbiota-filled brethren. So you can give mountains of antibiotics to a germ-free germ-free mouse, and it doesn't really change its behavior. Um, if you give mountains of antibiotics to a normal germ-ridden mouse, um, you can actually change its anxiety-related behaviors. And other rodent studies have shown that the judicious application of probiotics can lead to reduced anxiety in mice. Um, there are probiotics studies on humans as well, showing that probiotics um, can reduce uh, anxiety. So here's just one of the recent studies. This was done in the Netherlands. And so this was a randomized control trial, small number, I think, of university students, but a normal psychological profile. And so they took this um, probiotic called ecologic barrier, which was mostly some of these bifidobacteria, the lactobacillus species. And uh, they took daily for a month, and then they had them respond um, to sort of a, a negative stimulus. And the people on the probiotic, and they had a a control, they had a placebo as well. The people on the probiotic had decreased ruminative thoughts and decreased um, aggressive thoughts. This is kind of interesting because rumination, so the thought about thinking about something over and over and over, that is kind of the first step towards an anxiety or depressive disorder if you really get stuck um, in that. So here's just another picture of the gut-brain axis. And it's just part of the reason I'm throwing this up here is for any clinicians out there. I um, mean, this also shows where probiotics kind of come into the picture right there. So probiotics bro block this signal or they ameliorate the signal from the gut pathogens. And what's very interesting about this is this whole tryptophan piece here. So tryptophan is amino acid. And does anyone know the neurotransmitter that tryptophan is made into? Serotonin. Serotonin, that's right. But tryptophan can be made into serotonin or it can be made into chironic acid which is a little, it's kind of, an, it's more associated with suicide and negativity and, and neurotoxicity. Um, so what the probiotics do, we know in animal models, is that they increase tryptophan going to serotonin and not to this altered 5-HT, um, which is the chironic acid. And so, in effect, the probiotics work in a very similar way that actually antidepressants can work, but you don't get kind of all those nasty side effects. So this is why they are looking for, um, you know, specialty probiotics that they are probably going to, um, you know, sort of make genetically modify and try to make what are called psychobiotics, and they'll probably be very expensive. Um, but before that happens, um, I want to show you all sorts of different ways that you can actually modify your um, microbiota and you don't have to get some kind of GMO psychobiotic <laughs> coming your way. All right, so again, the, in mouse studies, killing um, gut pathogens with antibiotics or the application of probiotics has been shown to ameliorate this upregulation of the stress response, leading to less anxious behavior in mice. And the most studied probiotic strains, the lactobacillus and the bifidobacterium, 
um, tend to be anxiolytic. They tend to be anti-anxiety in, uh, in human applications and in mouse applications. So there's also, I, I want to stress this as well, it just becomes more and more complicated because there is a bi-directional communication. Um, you take a mouse away from his or her mother, so you stress a mouse and it'll alter the gut flora. Stress and sleep deprivation are known to affect um, human gut flora in a negative way. Um, in people with ma major depressive disorder, they do have this increased leaky gut, with, which you can see with translocation of gram-negative bacteria across the gut, and increased um, LPS, which is a marker on the outside of bacteria, but you'll see it inside your blood, which is not usually a good thing to see. And the last, we have 200 to 600 million neurons connecting the gut and the brain, all via the vagus nerve. And here's that creepy part. Um, they, these lactobacillus, all of these um, commensal bacteria, produce neurotransmitters. So they're talking to you. We don't know what they're saying. <laughs> um, we know this in mice. If you cut the vagus nerve, um, you cut off this communication. And what I really... Um, Get from this one is kind of intriguing that the lactobacillus and the bifidobacterium, these anti-anxiety ones, they actually produce GABA. GABA is the anti-anxiety sleep neurotransmitter, and that's pretty interesting. Um, and if you decide to get a fecal transplant, I would get it from someone who is happy and mellow. Because, <laughs> Um, so I'm just going to run through some studies, we're really at the beginning of this, um, so I'm just going to run through some studies of what they've just even found in different psychiatric dis disorders with um, changes in the microbiota. So the first one's pretty darn obvious to me anyway. In acute anorexia, people in the hospital, their microbiota is extremely diminished and the diversity of it is diminished. That's not really that surprising. You're starving, um, so your microbiota isn't good. but there's this question, is part of this behavior of um, you know, anorexia, when people get very, very, very um, deprived of nutrients, they're very obsessive. obsessive. They can be almost psychotic um, in the way that in, in, with body image. And it's part of that because their microbiota is so screwed up. And so maybe um, probiotics or something might be part of your intervention uh, for anorexia. There's another study um, of 55 people and they did fecal swabs, and then they did um, just a, a screening of their depression. And they were able to correlate the fecal swabs with the depressed individuals with 100% specificity and 97% sensitivity, just from their fecal swab. Yeah, so this is, this is the most, this would be the most sensitive test. I mean, this, this is by far um, more than the, the gold standard is usually 90 and 90 for specificity and sensitivity. That's pretty much a good test. Um, so this would be far above that, and that's kind of mind-blowing. I'd love to see that one repeated, because um, it was really the first 55 people, though it seems like a small number, but it was also their 5,500 trillion microbes, so I guess that was a big sample size. <laughs> so here's just another recent study. They um, tested the oropharynx in people with schizophrenia, and they found very significant differences in the oropharynx of people with schizophrenia and people without schizophrenia. And there's kind of an interesting gut-brain connection in schizophrenia. There was a huge, it's called the Katie trial um, in the United States of antipsychotics. And they did all sorts of uh, tests on people with schizophrenia in the community. And one of them were actually tests for antibodies um, that are related to celiac disease. And folks with schizophrenia are five to 10 times more likely um, than, the, than the general population to have antibodies that are um, associated with celiac disease. Also, in some people, psychosis is caused by autoimmune disease, like celiac disease, but also lupus. You know, is this a microbiota issue? And could we um, use psychobiotics or modulating um, the gut to kind of ameliorate or help people with or prevent schizophrenia? And I'm going to talk again more about modifying um, the commensals in a little bit. Um, but I'm going to move on just to kind of briefly, briefly touch again on the pseudocommensals and describe more about the parasites as well. So pseudocommensals, again, these are the ones that kind of pass through. They're always stopping by. They're in the dirt. I don't know how many of you have little kids who, before the age of two, ate dirt. This is my daughter before the age of two. Um, I don't really recommend eating dirt on a regular basis. There can be some nasty pathogens in there. Um, but there, it's this thought that this is sort of this natural way of, of kids building up 
um, their, both their microbiota and also having a nice healthy dose of um, pseudocommensals going through. And these are uh, saprophytic mycobacteria. And we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We probably shouldn't go out there and drink directly from the lake. We, modern hygiene saves us from Giardia. It saves us from cholera um, and all sorts of nasty things. But how can we kind of harness this knowledge to maybe help, um, help our immune systems be better using some of these um, organisms in a safe way? So our next old friend are the helminths and the eukaryotic parasites. So prior to 1975, most children in America had exposure to pingworms and other um, parasites. The only ones I can think of that we really have any um, exposure to now is actually head lice and uh, maybe blastocyst. Blastocytosis is pretty common. Um, but otherwise, we just, we just don't have the parasites we used to have. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. In Africa, um, hookworms are endemic. 50,000 kids a year die of hookworms. Even more die from schistosomiasis. Um, but deworming protocols also have an interesting cost. Um, so this is just a study. You may not be reading parasitology journals, but this is, this is just an example study. There are many just like this. So th these were pregnant moms. These are so the children of pregnant moms that they gave um, an anti-worming agent, and it's the black one. The black line are the children of the moms who were given the anti-worming agent while the moms were pregnant. The dotted line are the children who weren't given, and you can see the risk of eczema of the deworm of the children of the deworm mo moms is triple the risk of the not deworm moms. So there's definitely this big immune process going on there. So this is going to be on the test later. <laughs> Um, but I do love a slide. It's actually an open access. This is Wang in Brain Behavior and Immunity in April 2014. It's an open access journal if you really want to look at this stuff. And this is a beautiful diagram that kind of pulls it all together. My simple message here, the old friends upregulate our regulatory T cells. These are kind of the generals of the immune system. So without the old friends, you might have an army and a navy and a Coast Guard, and one of those arms of the immune system might kind of run rampant. So you've got a commander in chief, if you have the T-Rex, they can say, hey, hold back guys, you know, play it cool. And also direct, hey, you know, you guys haven't been doing immune surveillance for cancer in a little while. Why don't you kind of go look over there? So these old friends, they just, and a, the simplest thing you do is upregulate these T-regulatory cells, and that just keeps everything working all nice and as it should be in our bodies, okay? So therefore, via the immune inflammatory direct brain communication and hormonal mechanisms, commensals and the other old friends have a hand or cilia in all kinds of human disease, um, autoimmune disease, GI disorders, cancer, psychiatric disease, neurological disease, even obesity and metabolic syndrome. Like you can give a mouse the flora from an obese human and make the mouse obese. So this is just another um, slide. This is from a Graham Rook, and it just this is you're upregulating the T regulatory cells, and it shows just all these different. If you have these in balance, T regulatory to the T regulatory cells to the rest of your T cells, if they're in balance, then you get a nice um, immune system that's ready to go when you need it, and it's not attacking your own cells like an autoimmune disease. And so here's some more evidence that gut pathology is very much related to brain pathology. Um, a lot of my patients have autoimmune disease. They come in with um, rheumatoid arthritis. They come in with lupus. They come in with MS. They come in with um, thyroid issues that are autoimmune. And it's much higher than the general population. So I see a lot of people with autoimmune disease who also have anxiety and depressive disorders. There's also a huge comorbidity between irritable bowel syndrome and anxiety and depression. And in many ways, if you look at the blood and the, and the cytokines that are kind of floating around in the blood and people with IBS and, and major depression, it's identical. So this kind of may be out there, but I have this feeling that IBS and major depression are actually the same disease, but they just express themselves with a different phenotype. Um, generalized anxiety disorder, I kind of throw in there as well, but I'm kind of a lumper. Not everybody likes that. 
And I already mentioned the schizophrenia comorbidity with celiac disease. There's something going on there. And then this is important to many people. With the autistic spectrum disorders, there's a lot of interest in the gut pathology, leaky guts. They tend to have higher um, levels of uh, gut pathogens like clostridium. They'll have abnormal levels of the gut commensals. Um, they'll have lots of IBS complaints, complaints about food, stomach aches, things like that, um, food sensitivities. And so that may also be a microbiota issue as well. So how do we modulate uh, commensals? How do we uh, make this useful? We're just starting to understand the gut-brain connection. And again, they're gonna probably come up with the expensive psychobiotics, um, but you can actually change it. There are a few ways to change it permanently, very quickly. One is diet. So in um, several studies, if you just change your diet to a little bit more high fiber or a little bit low carb, you can adjust your microbiota within the matter of days. A second way, you can take fermented foods, kimchi, um, kombucha, yogurt, any of those um, things. Some are more palatable than others. Uh, you can take probiotics. There's all sorts of different kinds of them. You can also take prebiotics, which are things like inulin, Jerusalem, Jeru they're food ones, so like Jerusalem artichokes. Um, and there are also powder ones that you can take if um, you know, I prefer sort of the food ones from this ancestral health, but if people are really wigged out or they have gut trouble, sometimes you can add a little bit of powdered fibers um, in very small amounts if they have reactions to things. And that's a way to kind of slowly add that in the prebiotics to feed the gut bacteria. Antibiotics are also sometimes used if you find a high level of pathogens in the gut. And there are both sort of herbal antibiotics and also just your standard old antibiotics. And then the last one is the fecal transplant, which um, in America, um, it's used for the treatment of C. difficile. Uh, is it used here in New Zealand? Okay. So it, the main problem actually in America is finding donors and having them paid for because insurance won't pay for the donor. You have to get sort of an investigation, sort of like donating blood. So it costs, I think, about $3,000 because they have to check you for HIV and, and some other things. And... Um, and it's really hard to get that paid for. So they only have a few donors that either you know, they got a grant for or something. So these few guys who go to Mass General Hospital and poop for them. And they, <laughs> they use it to you know, really cure all these patients with C. difficile, which is this awful, awful disease that just basically strips your colon. Um, it's an awful infection brought on by overuse or sometimes necessary use for um, really bad infections of um, antibiotics. And it saves their lives. And it sounds horrible, but it's either sort of like a nice colonic enema, or they've um, they've now uh, you can double wrap enteric coated um, capsules, and um, that's I think maybe a more pleasant way of having your fecal transplant. Um, but they've been showing that that works as well. <laughs> so I just wanted to show you this is <laughs> the reason I don't have oh, too many cute graphs up here is that this is the kind of data you get from the microbiota studies. <laughs> um, this is actually a study of, they had um, African-American men and South African men switch diets, and uh, that which actually led to the 250% decrease in the healthy butyrate producing species in the African men within 14 days. Um, but I really just put this slide here to uh, show the complexity of the data. And this is why I'm not here saying, well, take this, this, and this for your psychobiotic re recipe, and it's going to be awesome. We don't have that quite figured out yet. Um, and it's really hard to show really pretty clean graphs of this kind of data. So I'm just going to go through a few more slides now of uh, human studies where uh, probiotics and prebiotics have been used in the context of, um, for health and sort of emotional symptoms. So the first one's a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled pilot study of a probiotic and emotional symptoms of chronic fatigue syndrome. It did decrease um, depression and anxiety um, symptoms. The next slide, um, they were using a prebiotic in irritable bowel and it did help the irritable bowel symptoms. This one, the consumption of the fermented milk product, otherwise known as yogurt, um, with a probiotic, it modulated the uh, brain activity in young women. That's pretty non-committal title, actually. <laughs> but it, it tended to make the women less anxious. And I, I think this is the one they actually did an Im imaging study, and it showed um, kind of different patterns in their brain. 
This bottom one, I think, is my favorite one here because this was a study done in Japan of people with psychotic depression. So psychotic depression is a relatively rare but pretty serious form of depression that can be very dangerous. And uh, regular antidepressants don't work. That's not standard of care. You really have to go for antipsychotic medication or shock therapy. So those are kind of your choices if someone has um, a bad psychotic depression. There's a high rate of suicide, and they just don't get better on their own. Um, so in Japan, they gave all these people with psychotic depression, they gave them an antidepressant, which we know doesn't really work all that well. And then instead of antipsychotics, they actually gave them an antibiotic, minocycline. And um, the patients actually started getting better, which is really mind-blowing. My favorite thing about this study is that nowhere in this paper is the word microbiota mentioned. They didn't even think of it as one of the mechanisms. They thought that minocycline might have a separate anti-inflammatory mechanism in the brain. But I suspect that it's a microbiome that... Maybe there's some um, pathogens that, you know, if someone's already depressed and they have these pathogens, it makes people delusional and psychotic and a much more serious depression. But we don't know that yet. So this is just kind of rehashing how we modulate commensals. So get that fiber. These are sort of just different um, fibers that you can get. Um, but you can get it from fruits and vegetables. You don't have to get it from grains. Um, I know we're told... We're supposed to eat grains for the fiber, but there's if you eat lots of fruits and vegetables, you're probably fine. Some starchy carbs as well, so potatoes, rice, um, and they feed your healthy bacteria. You can do fermented foods and probiotics. I would avoid too much alcohol, sorry. Um, ibuprofen, stress, and sleep deprivation. I mean, this is kind of, that's kind of a no-brainer anyway for mental health. Um, you can also, if you have a really upset kind of overgrown uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, those kinds of issues, you can do a temporary kind of low carb or what's called a low FODMAP diet. So FODMAPs are fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. So I just call it FODMAPs. Um, and that will kind of starve out. They think that might be an imbalance of your microbiota. And if you do that low carb diet um, and, or low FODMAP diet for maybe six weeks, it kind of starves out the bad guys. And then you start throwing in probiotics and you start adding back in your FODMAPs very, very slowly. And so hopefully you're building up a friendly your microbiota. Okay. You can also, you know, if things are really rough and I think we're going to have more of people doing ubiome and other kind of stool testing um, to say, oh, is there anything really nasty there? You can use antibiotics um, for berberine and some GM microbex, walnut, black walnut. I do have a friend who's a gastroenterologist who trained at um, Johns Hopkins, she did write a paper showing that for um, a SIBO, so a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, uh, that some of these herbal preparations are actually equivalent to the uh, prescription antibiotic preparations. So that was good news. Um, so how do you modulate the pseudocommensals? So if someone can't tolerate the regular um, probiotics, has anybody taken, anybody with IBS or had a patient with IBS who took a regular probiotic and they got worse? Yeah, so I see that back there. So that often happens, again, if you have this overgrowth. Um, regular pro probiotics, the most ones that you get, they're mostly lactobacillus strain, sometimes bifidobacterium. They're lactic acid producing, and they can cause you to actually get worse um, at first. You can try this person on a soil-based probiotic. I'm aware of a couple of different brands, but you can Google soil-based probiotics, and they're more friendly to those kinds of um, uh, People and then the BCG vaccine. Does anybody know what that is? Right, it's a vaccine uh, for tuberculosis, but it's actually Mycobacterium bovis. So it's a mycobacteria. So those are the things found in pseudocommensals. And so a BCG vaccine is a sort of a chronic infection uh, for a little while with a mycobacteria. And what's fascinating about this is that people who have been vaccinated with the BCG vaccine have a 60% um, lower chance of developing melanoma. They're actually investigating this vaccine to tr for treatment of melanoma. Um, so that, that's really interesting. You can look it up in PubMed, I'm not lying. <laughs> um, the other thing they do with mod modulating pseudocommensals, there's a few studies where they take Mycobacterium vaccae, they kill it, and then they feed it to people, cancer patients. Um, and here's just the data showing with this BCG vaccine, so those middle two, there's the 60% reduced uh, risk of melanoma. And these are all adjusted for 
ethnic origin, um, freckling, um, number of knee by number of sunburns. So it's really fascinating finding to me. Um, and these are the um, mycobacterium studies. So decreasing anxiety in cancer patients, um, decreasing anxiety in mice. And then the clinical parasites, the heebie-jeebie ones. So um, these have some fascinating results in refractory Crohn's disease and MS. Um, have any of you guys heard of Jasper Lawrence? So this is a guy from California, I believe, and he had really intractable asthma and nothing was working. He was on prednisone, he was on all sorts of inhalers and nothing really worked. He really had no quality of life. He couldn't um, work. He really uh, could rarely leave his house. And so he investigated helminths and he decided to go to Africa and walk around in latrines um, with bare feet. And um, he infected himself with hookworms and it cured his terrible asthma. And so what he did at this point was he sells hookworm eggs on a patch and he sold it to people who were pretty desperate with their autoimmune disease. And bad autoimmune disease, you have some pretty um, serious uh, treatments for it. I mean, it's better than dying, but you're, you're high dose steroids and high dose immune suppressants and things like that. So they're willing to try hookworms, um, but he got in trouble with the FDA. So he actually had to move to uh, England and it's very, uh, it's quite expensive um, to get some of these things. And they're still really investigational. These are mostly desperate people. And they have some side effects. Hookworms, for example, in their life cycle, they actually go through their lungs, so you can get a pneumonitis um, from having hookworms. And I think that's sort of underplayed. I actually go and look on Facebook and um, Yahoo sites for people who have taken these clinical parasites, because I'm looking for some of the psychiatric effects. And what you will find most of all is there are people who had terrible anxiety that, that after they started taking some of these parasites, um, their anxiety went away, which is pretty amazing. Um, but one guy with OCD and uh, what he had o OCD and Crohn's disease and his OCD and his Crohn's disease went away with the application of some of these parasites. Um, and it, there was a start, a kid had, um, uh, he had a terrible autoimmune disease, I can't remember what else, but he also had terrible panic attacks and wasn't able to go to school and his panic attacks completely went away. Now, I really don't want to design that study or try to recruit for the study of giving people worms for their anxiety disorder, but it's um, something to consider that this last one here, the rat tapeworm, that one seems to have stronger effects on the immune system and fewer side effects than any of these other ones. And this is pretty new, they're investigating this. So I'm kind of most interested in that one. Um, but we have a lot to learn. So here's, oh, it's not FDA approved. <laughs> um, so here's just one study of using um, a pig whipworm ova in Crohn's disease. And these were refractory patients who were basically facing colectomy, having their colon taken out. And they had um, these uh, ova given to them and it, by 24 weeks, you know, 70% of them were in um, remission and uh, up to 80% had a response to the medication. So that's to the, to the worms. So that's very powerful. This study was repeated, but they didn't do the dosing of the ova the same. And the, the following study was actually a failure. There was no difference. And I don't know why they changed the dosing. So just in the interest of science, not scientism and splashy headlines, keep it in mind that this is sort of an iffy finding, um, but it really hasn't been repeated as it was done here. And so um, you, this is my final takeaway point. Uh, the gut-brain connection is real. It's deeply intrinsic to the inflammatory mechanisms of depression, anxiety, and other mental illness. We're starting to develop some human evidence to suggest probiotics may be safe and effective augmenting agents for conventional therapies, particularly for anxiety. The pseudocommensals in the helmets are even more powerful interventions, but need to be further researched. And I hope with a little help from our friends, we can develop innovative new strategies to help defeat these mental health problems.